Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. Good afternoon, President Debbie. Can everyone hear me in Zoom land? Yep. We're good. And everyone can see my screen? Perfect. Awesome. Okay. And we're good here. So welcome to the weekly meeting of Rotary Club of Barry. Things go better when you are here because we actually have our sound system going awesome right now and that is because everybody is here. So thank you for that. Um, we'll now begin our meeting with O Canada and a toast to the Queen. Everybody recognized Aria, Al Mallory's daughter from uh, when she did it. So that's pretty special and they use that at the conference. So pretty nice. So we have our Beacon editor today is Marta Ross. And thank you, Kara, for a great Beacon last week. A um, little bit of uh, quirks and personality put in there. So it was fun to read. Um, we have a visiting Rotarian, Dr. J. Uh, thank you, President Deb. I do have a visiting guest today, and that would be Tanya Seri. Thank you. Welcome, Tanya. I know we're getting closer, so thanks for your patience. <laughs> and we have, uh, to start off, special announcements. Uh, we have Dave Tisch. Sorry, I just have to get ready here a little bit. Hey. President Debbie, fellow Rotarians and friends of Rotary, again, like last week, as I started last week, I just want to say that uh, probably by the end of this presentation, you're going to think that I'm the guest speaker, but uh, rest assured, I'm pretty positive that President Deb has someone more uh, interesting to speak to than, or speak to you than I am. I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, just going over um, or discussing uh, the short a short history of polio in Canada and why we need to keep supporting uh, Polio Plus. Long before the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19 began its spread and stoked fear and anxiety across the globe, there was another lethal disease that was advancing rapidly and causing both terror worldwide and in Canada. This disease has plagued mankind for a long time. This slide depicts a Egyptian stele, which is dated from 3,600 BC, uh, which shows a picture of a man that's thought to be thought to have suffered from polio. Although never really called a pandemic, um, there have been many epidemics of poliomyelitis around the world. What's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic disease? We tend to use these words a little bit interchangeably these days. And an epidemic is one that affects many people at the same time spreading from one person to another in a locality where the disease is not permanently present. It usually occurs at the level of a region um, or a community. The term comes from the Greek words epi, meaning over, and demos, meaning village. So it affects a village, basically. A pandemic disease involves all members of humanity, such as is the case with COVID-19. 
Again, it comes from the Greek meaning pan, all or everything, and demos meaning village. Polio has had many names over the years, uh, known as infantile paralysis, the crippler, the wrath of God. The poliomyelitis comes from the Greek again, uh, meaning gray, and uh, uh, myelon, meaning marrow. The first recorded case of um, polio in Canada was in Hamilton, Ontario, when a young girl uh, was admitted to the hospital with a suspected case of rabies. She died in hospital and was later diagnosed uh, after autopsy with poliomyelitis. The virus quickly spread to other communities in Ontario, including Toronto, Windsor, and Niagara Falls. Polio outbreaks are prevalent most frequently in the fall and summer, and by 1937, there were 4,000 cases reported in Canada, with half of those basically in Ontario with 119 deaths. Quarantines are very commonplace today, and similar tactics were used in the early days of the polio epidemics. Quarantine comes from the Italian Quaranta giorni, which is, means 40 days. In Venice in the 1380s, ships suspected of carrying infectious diseases were um, isolated in the harbor for 40 days before being allowed to um, unload their cargoes or crews um, to mix with the population. And this was done to stave off the Black Death. Public health departments in Canada at that time in 1937 quarantined the sick, they closed roads, closed schools, restricted children from traveling to playgrounds and cinemas, um, and although there's some controversy over the effectiveness of these types of measures, particularly on the mortality of the disease, um, but we can see the type of problems that are caused by COVID-19. Uh, Jeff, did you go to the next slide? Sorry, I didn't have a copy on. Um, uh, you can see that the mortality rate of COVID-19 is three to 4%, whereas the mortality rate for polio is two to uh, 5% in children and 15 to 30% in adults and adolescents. In spite of the death, disruption, fear of the disease, it caused Canadians to go to great lengths to help the ill and save lives. In 1937, there was only one iron lung in Canada. Uh, an iron lung is a mechanical respirator that's needed by some polio patients to enable them to breathe on their own. In August of 1937, Gordon Jackson, who was almost four years of age, was admitted to the hospital for sick children. He was diagnosed with polio. This was in the summer of the worst epidemic in Toronto. This disease had progressed very rapidly his limbs were paralyzed, but then he quickly started to go downhill, having difficulty breathing. The only iron lung was in Canada was being used by a young girl who was dependent upon us already. Um, and uh, there would be a couple of weeks before the hospital was going to get its next uh, iron lung. Gordon's case highlights how fast polio can progress and how its threat can prompt extraordinary efforts to fight it. When Gordon's breathing became more and more weakened, doctors were able to find a small, experimental respirator that was designed for premature infants. The hospital's engineers and uh, carpenters scrambled to build a larger wooden cabinet, um, and this was done in less than six hours. By the time the wooden lung was ready, Gordon was blue, and his breathing was very labored. But after two hours in the wooden lung, his color came back and he was bleeding. Gordon was soon able to leave his wooden lung for an iron lung, and was then given a new portable respiratory jacket, which you can see on this slide. A newspaper reported that nine months later, Gordon was free of any assisted breathing devices, but was still in hospital. With polio number, polio cases rising, it's very likely that more mobile cases were going to be seen. Mobile polio occurs when the virus attacks the brainstem. And I have to here apologize to Ron Dennis for leaking health information, but I have to tell you that if you look at the bottom of the slide, it does say Ron Dennis's brain transplant. And I didn't touch this slide at all. This is from, uh, from the internet. So I had to find a place to use this slide. Um, so when the virus attacks the brainstem, uh, there, this results in difficulty breathing, uh, swallowing, and speaking. The hospital for sick children, uh, children's engineers and carpenters then sprang into action. And over the next six weeks, they were able to build an additional 27 wooden lungs in the hospital's basements and rush ship them to um, areas across Canada where they were needed. Although there was a decline in cases in the Second World War, they increased substantially after the war. The number of cases reached a peak in Canada in 1953 with nearly 9,000 cases um, and uh, 500 deaths. This was the most serious epidemic since the 1918-1920 Spanish flu pandemic. The Canadian Air Force transported iron lungs across the country in a desperate attempt to uh, uh, meet the crisis. The Western provinces in particular, much like today, uh, were particularly hard hit. In one Winnipeg hospital, there were 72 iron lungs going at once at the peak of the epidemic. When a thunderstorm knocked out power in an Edmonton hospital, nurses had to scramble to manually pump each of the iron lungs. 
the widespread application of the soft vaccine, which was introduced in 1955, and the Sabine oral vaccine in 1962 eventually brought polio under control. Uh, and this happened in about the 1970s. Canada still vaccinates against polio uh, with the use of the soft vaccine, the inactive form of, of the uh, vaccine, which is given at two, four, and six months of age. Canada was not declared polio free until 1994. This graph, next graph, shows um, the reported cases of polio in Canada between 1927 and 2011. And you can see the spike in 1937, a little decline after, during the war years in 1940 to 45. And then uh, we see the peak again in 1953, and then no reported cases after 1970. In 1988, the GPEI, or Global Polio Eradication Initiative, had been formed by components of the World Health Organization, Rotary, UNICEF, and the, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. This was joined in the year 2000 by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, which is the world's richest privately held uh, foundation with assets around $46 billion. In the inauguration year in 1988, WHO um, uh, resolved at that time to eradicate the wild polio virus by the year 2000. Yet here we are still 20 years later trying to fight off this, uh, um, uh, to eradicate polio, and again in the midst of a new pandemic. So what are our current challenges right now? There are two major ones. One first is polio-associated paralytic polio, and the second being elimination of the wild polio virus in the environment. The type two, there are three types, serotypes of virus, type P1, 2, and 3. The P2 is gone. We no longer have that. We just really have the P1 and P3 uh, serotypes that are present. So the last defined case of natural polio in the United Kingdom, for example, was in 1984. But between the uh, years of 1985 and 2000, there were 40 cases of paralytic polio that were reported. However, 30 of these were vaccine-associated paralytic polio. Others were found coming from areas that had endemic polio and uh, no wild virus was found. In 2000, there was an outbreak in Hispaniola, which is the islands of, the island includes, that includes Haiti and Dominican Republic. Um, and again, this was found to be a recombinant virus uh, from the Sabine strain or the um, vaccine strain with an unknown virus that caused the paralytic polio. <laughs> vaccine associated paralytic poliomyelitis will continue to be a serious threat as long as oral vaccine is used. Scientific data has concluded beyond a shadow of a doubt that polio eradication will also require the eventual disuse of the oral vaccine. Otherwise, we, would see, we will see a resurgence in a polio-free world due to vaccine-associated paralysis or uh, paralytic polio and outbreaks due to circulating uh, polio uh, vaccine-derived polio virus. Polio-free countries such as Canada will be under constant threat of importing a vaccine-derived polio virus from places where the oral vaccine is used. This chart demonstrates how close we are to elimination of the wild polio virus. I know it's going to be kind of hard to see up there, but these are 20 countries from the Asian uh, section of the WHO. You can see in the wild polio cases, there are only two countries that have endemic wild polio virus, being Afghanistan and Pakistan. And of those, there are 175 cases um, of wild polio virus. But if you look at the 20 countries that are involved uh, in this section, um, there's only one that doesn't have vaccine-associated poliomyelitis cases, paralytic polio cases. But our greatest challenge uh, is going to be to stop the transmission of the wild polio virus. Uh, and there are many factors that pose challenges to this uh, uh, process. The first is geographically difficult terrain which makes delivery of vaccines very difficult. So just imagine trying to negotiate a Jeep and or a, a trailer along roads such as this to get to isolated villages in Pakistan, say, for example. There are sanitation issues. Uh, people living under conditions like this just keep circulating the virus all around because their water supply is contaminated with fecal material. As you probably know, the route of transmission for polio is the oral fecal route. So the virus just keeps circulating around so you really cannot eliminate it from the environment in situations like this. In some areas, we have lack of, of the cooperation of the local authorities. And these people will not allow the vaccinators to get into villages and uh, vaccinate them. And then there are religious factions that are campaigning against the vaccine drive with conspiracy theories that the, it is a Western plot to sterilize Muslim women. It also doesn't help that in 2011, the CIA did a, a fake vaccination program to try to route out uh, Osama bin Laden. And this has resulted in a lack of trust from local authorities as well in the state. Like COVID-19, poliovirus does not recognize political boundaries. In 2011, 
an outbreak in Jiangxing province in China occurred. This area had been certified polio free for 10 years. And the outbreak was found to be due to a wild strain of virus from Pakistan. To contain this virus, it required 43.7 million doses of oral polio vaccine that was delivered in five rounds of vaccination. I think this aptly illustrates that until the time comes that polio is eradicated in all countries, polio-free countries like Canada, again, are going to be under threat. It's estimated that if we don't stop the spread of polio within 10 years, we're going to see 200,000 cases annually. We should not let the efforts of thousands of people working religiously for decades and millions of people donating for decades to this cause to go to waste. Please don't be a Rotarian that tries to eliminate polio by association with Rotary. Do it with action. Donate to Polio Plus today. You can donate whatever you can. My suggestion is simply to donate the cost of one Rotary meal, since we're not having lunches and you're saving that money anyway. And then at, at some point in the future, you're gonna be able to say to your children and grandchildren, I helped eliminate polio from the planet. Credit card donations can be made at trfcanada.org. This will allow you to make a, uh, a donation online, as well as collect whatever points you get on your credit card. Also, if you make a donation to the annual fund or Polio Plus, you'll get um, credit, um, Paul Harris recognition credits uh, towards your first Paul Harris or your multiple Paul Harris. If you do make any donations online, please drop me a quick email just to let me know where you donated annual fund or Polio Plus and how much you donated so we can keep track of our uh, donations so we can see if we're meeting our goals. If you attend meetings, and unfortunately this is our last meeting for this year, you could give me a check um, and I'll take care of the rest. But since we're not attending meetings, you can simply drop a check off at my home. You can mail it to me at home. If you don't want to have contact at the mailbox right on the front doorstep, you can just drop it in the mailbox and go. I check the mailbox regular. I hope you found this presentation interesting. I've been able to learn a few things. Um, please consider supporting the Rotary International Foundation, and in particular, Polio Plus. Um, it is, after all, one of your foundations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. I know you put a lot of work in, and uh, I believe this is a number of years that you've taken on this cause, and you've made quite a difference. So thank you very much for all of your efforts. Oh, we have some more announcements. Um, Allison, do I see Allison out there? There she is. Yep, can you unmute? Sorry, what am I announcing? I believe you have a <laughs> award to announce. Oh, next week. Oh, is it next week? Next week. Next week, okay. Get you in there. Sorry, Debbie. That's okay. Um, Dave McCullough. Thank you, uh, President uh, fellow Rotarians. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone that signed up to uh, man the calls. Uh, we filled the roster in about three days, which was great at both locations and all time slots. Unfortunately, uh, we're not needed. Uh, Salvation Army has made the decision that they need to roll back some of the locations due to the new uh, or the spike in some of the COVID cases. So uh, Chris Van Niekert received an email last night that uh, the two locations uh, that we were assigned to will not be having kettles and they look forward to us helping next year. And an email will be going out to everyone through Jeff McEwick. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Brian Galbraith. Hello, uh, thank you, President Deb. Uh, fellow Rotarians. I'm just here uh, seeking the help of more Rotarians uh, in the Santa by Zoom project. We, we had a meeting, we have five Santas who have signed up. Uh, I'm looking at Doug Manning, he hardly needs uh, uh, to put a costume on with that nice gray beard. And uh, a few others of you, <clears throat> if you can give up a, a bit of time, what we're doing is um, signing people up for a block of two hours. Uh, when they would make themselves available uh, from uh, home, uh, dressed up as Santa Claus and uh, having a Zoom conversation with uh, children. Uh, and each person who wants to have a Zoom com uh, conversation will just um, donate uh, some money to the club. So we're asking for a minimum donation of $10 uh, for a five or, five or six minute Zoom conversation with Santa. We anticipate, as has been in the past, that people will donate 
even um, a lot more than that, knowing that it goes to a good cause. So if you're able to give up some time, have a good, a good internet, and I see all of these people have good internets, President's Dev, they're doing Zoom right now. Uh, and uh, they have a, we have some uh, uh, sad outfits, we, uh, but if you have your own, that's ideal. Please contact me. Uh, we really need your help because uh, this is all just going to be cash in the bank for the club. So uh, please, please step up and uh, give us some of your time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for putting all the effort and getting all that pulled together. I know I have a couple of grandchildren that are uh, quite excited about the prospect of actually talking to Santa. However, I have one that says that, but then as soon as that happens, he just kind of hides and doesn't say anything until Santa leaves. So we'll have to see how that one goes. So on to birthdays and anniversaries. We have Kelly Best, November 26th, happy birthday. And Larry Jones, uh, November 29th. We have no club, or, nope, we have no married anniversaries, couple anniversaries, but we do have uh, Jack Garner is 56 years, November 26th. He joined 1964, incredible. And Dave McCullough, who joined 19 years, a little bit more ways to go there, uh, Dave, to catch up to Jack uh, on November 29th, 2001. So congratulations all, and do we have... And one, and two, and one, two, three, four. Happy birthday to you. you're feeling special. Um, if uh, you had come to our hybrid meeting, you would have been receiving our wonderful kind of picture there. Uh, so for the happy birthday, a donation to Polio uh, Plus, and for your the club anniversary, a donation to the fight against COVID-19. So move on here. SAA. Eric. <laughs> Got to remember to actually put the vest on for its best effect. Okay. Thanks, President Deb. I will come on up here so you guys can see me. Um, Jeff's got a couple of slides for me. So, uh, President Deb, thanks for, uh, for the opportunity. Um, there, uh, there's a couple of things I'm going to bring in that you're un unaware of but I'll get to those. Uh, let's go first slide. Yes, um, uh, duty roster. You know, for you that have been Rotarians for a long time, duty roster shouldn't really be much of a mystery, uh, and yet it doesn't seem to be something we're following very carefully. This is what it looks like. So if you haven't opened your beacon in the last six or eight months, uh, please do open your beacon, take a look and see what you are responsible for, uh, and if you can't do something, get a replacement. Uh, so who we got there? But, uh, this, this is uh, November 26. Uh, Larry Jones is the captain. I saw Bill Forster here doing setup as per his uh, duty roster. I noticed we've got a beacon uh, replacement on today, so Marta's doing that. So that's all great to see. Um, I'm assuming Stu McMillan is doing his job on Zoom attendance. If uh, if you're one of those who has forgotten to look at the beacon in the last several months and may have missed a duty roster, uh, please do make a gift. Uh, to the SAA fund, uh, get online, uh, the e-transfer to me, or make a gift to the club. Uh, and uh, just a reminder of uh, duty roster. So the beacon is there for a reason. Please check it out. Uh, President Deb, I was thinking five bucks is probably a good uh, duty roster failure fine. I think, I think I'll be generous and go to $1 okay. just to encourage people to, to do, their duty know, do this and it's getting close to Christmas to be a little kinder. Very nice. And there's a lot of them, so we should at least uh, that's true. 120 bucks with a buck each. This is true. All right, so there are um, uh, buckets here today for those of you that are here in the, in the meeting today. Uh, next one, Jeff. Uh, this is a, a heads up. Uh, we're hoping that Julia from Rotaract will be with us next week. 
Uh, Rotor Act is, uh, is putting together a car rally and a kind of a scavenger hunt. Uh, Wayne Dennis has been a big help for Rotor Act on this, so has Alan Mallory. Um, and uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, so Julia will tell you more about it. Uh, but it really is a learn more about Rotary, uh, get around to some of the sites and uh, the sites within the city and beyond the city uh, where Rotary has had a real impact uh, and a great way to work together with Rotaract. So keep your eyes open for that. They've made it in a way that will make it very socially distanced, lots of flexibility on timing. Um, so uh, we'll see Julia next week at the Zoom meeting. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to bring that highlight to your attention. Um, let's uh, take a look at the next one. Uh, Mr. Tucky is not here. Jacqueline's here, but we're not going to uh, tag her with the sins of the father. Uh, so we'll come back to Mr. Tucky at a future meeting. Okay, this is one. Um, Allison and Al, Al Mallory are, uh, are on the line, and I'm going to um, uh, see if they would like to unmute. Uh, but this is just a shout out to the book project. Uh, the Ample Dumpling Contest uh, was a, is a really great idea to see kids engaged. Uh, in the book. Uh, Jeff, have you got that little video? Uh, so if you're not on social media, I wanted to draw your attention to this and, uh, and encourage you to get on uh, and take a look at some of the great photos that families have sent in of kids using the book to make apple dumplings. This was a particularly nice one. That's great. This is a, what a great idea to just do something that actually activates the book project, takes it out in the community. Uh, and we saw many great photos of kids with their older sisters and their moms and their grandmoms uh, doing uh, apple dumplings. So that's a, just a, a shout out. Allison or Al, do you have any uh, updates on, uh, on how that project went uh, for the uh, social media portion? Uh, well, I, I'll just say that we're, we're getting, you know, great. Um, it's incredible. It's kind of seeing all the, well, the parents and the kids, but the big smiles on their faces. If you haven't been on social media, just check them all out. Certainly go on there. And so, uh, so that's fun. And then, of course, we're going to draw for a, um, what do they call it, a, Chrome, a Chromebook um, for all those that participated. But, uh, but yeah, no, I can see us maybe doing this for future years as well. It's a, it's a great way to get families involved. That's great. Thanks. Uh, any comments from you, Deb, on that one? Congratulations, and I can't wait for you to make your apple dumplings so we can have some. <laughs> it's definitely re-inspired re me to do that. Um, but uh, again, just a, that's just a shout out to a, a committee taking it to another level uh, for community engagement. Um, I think I've got one more photo there, uh, Jeff. This is more in the nature of a shout out as well. Uh, here we go. Um, yes, this was just a captured on social media moment, uh, a little bit of uh, tree lighting. Uh, President Deb, do you want to tell us what was going on in this? I saw this on Councillor Gungle's um, uh, uh, Facebook page. Yeah, I, I'd like to say I'd like to take all the credit for this, but really, um, I just kind of showed up and, and I termed it, I pulled the Patrick Brown. So if you remember Patrick Brown, he always showed up just in time for the picture. That's exactly what I did. But congratulations to John Laking and his whole team. They did an amazing job. They've been challenged down there with some um, damage happening. Um, so please, you know, take a walk down, keep your eyes open, have a chance to go through. They're keeping, keeping on it and keeping the lights on. So congratulations to all of them. We have a last minute opportunity today as well. Uh, uh, Dave Tish, our first guest speaker of the day. Um, 
somebody mentioned you were, you seem to be talking about a new vehicle and uh, and when it was first said it it was talked about as a caddy and I assumed you had a new golf uh, assistant uh, do you want to uh, come up to the uh, to the podium and tell us a little bit about that Thank you, President Deb and uh, SAA Eric. Uh, yes, it, uh, it was back in, I think it was around uh, April or so that I got a new vehicle, uh, uh, a Cadillac XT5. Uh, and uh, I've been enjoying driving around in that, although not driving very far with it, but uh, it's been a, a pleasure uh, to drive that. So President Deb, Dave, I'm assuming that you probably told Kyle, SAA Kyle at the time, all about that car and probably paid a hefty fine. Oh, that did not occur. Uh, President Deb, what do you have to say for a late time? Uh, that's, that's really a shame. Um, past President Dave, how fast does it go? I don't know. I have never gotten it up. I've gotten it close to 150, but never over. <laughs> okay. You know, if, if, if it went really fast, then you would have, you know, wouldn't have a fine. An SUV. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know, then I think you're in for five bucks. Thank you, President I'll take it. Five bucks for a caddy, he's walking away happy. <laughs> All right, um, today is a kind of a special day, if you, and you may not be aware of it. Uh, there's a uh, radiothon and streamathon going on in support of RVH. Uh, it's uh, uh, CTV Barry is doing a, a streamathon. It's on right now, actually, so uh, you're missing out on a tremendous show. Um, and then the radio stations, uh, Pure Country and The Dock, uh, have, are doing a radiothon all day. Um, Jeff, have you got a little something uh, we might show on that? Debbie here and Steve Blanchett here. We woke up this morning so inspired by the fact that today is the RVH Spirit of Giving fundraiser. That's right. With being co-chair of the RVH Moments Matter campaign, along with Mary Ann Frith, I really have had a unique opportunity to see the planning for the RVH Spirit of Giving unfold over the past couple of months and hear of all the great things that will be taking place today. While we were drinking our tea and coffee and chatting about this wonderful initiative in support of patient care at RVH, we decided to kick things off in a big way. Would you like to tell them? Oh, absolutely. This is the most exciting part. We decided in the true spirit of giving we are going to match every gift made today up to $30,000. We are so proud of this wonderful community and we want to do our part to make sure we put the best tools in the best hands at RVH to make sure RVH is able to continue to provide the best care possible in the moments that matter most. So that's pretty nice news. I see lots of hands clapping out there. Um, I did not get a media release signed by Dave, uh, by Steve or Deb. Uh, let me show you that one. Uh, if you get a chance, we'll make sure we share the link later to the whole live stream. There's some tremendous uh, videos from caregivers at RVH, um, uh, a longer video with Steve and Deb, uh, and uh, a lot of great uh, musical talent uh, as well that, uh, that donated their uh, their services to come in and do something special uh, for uh, for this streamathon, uh, but I wanted to share that little bit that uh, Steve and Deb probably would not uh, choose to uh, to let you know on their own. Um, I think that's all I've got for you, President Deb. And uh, I'm going to sit down now. I might get a fine. Yeah, I think you did quite enough. <laughs> oh, thank you, S.A. Eric. Um, yeah, the last one was a bit of a surprise. I don't know if he couldn't see over my way, but I did punch him in the shoulder for that. But so we have a really great guest speaker. Um, if you do need to leave, now would be the appropriate time. Wonderful, everyone's staying. Catherine, would you like to introduce your special guest speaker? I don't see Catherine. Unmute. Unmute. There we go. Okay. Sorry, I thought I unmuted already. I'll start again. 
Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, okay. Well, I, I'll do a, a second time round then. So uh, good afternoon, President, Deb, fellow Rotarians and guests. Today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, today's speaker, Dr. Brad Dibble, who most of you know happen, also happens to be my husband. Um, over the years, uh, Brad has spoken to our club uh, several times. Um, he is a local cardiologist as well as a passionate environmentalist. Uh, who has been trained by Al Gore. Um, he has also penned a book entitled Comp uh, Comprehending the Climate Crisis. Uh, today, uh, Brad's gonna be talking about the art of denial and how, how people spread doubt about facts and science. So uh, take it away, Brad. Uh, thanks very much, Catherine. And um, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. So if I'm gonna share my slides, I'll need to have that function. Oh, I'm a co-host, excellent, okay. Let me share this and I should be able to zip over to this. Oh, we're seeing your ECGs there, oh, okay. <laughs> now, yeah, you shouldn't anymore. I think you should be able to see it this way. Do you see my title slide now? Yes. All right, so um, thanks everyone. I think that uh, this is an important subject, uh, especially as time goes on. We hear a lot of information about whether something is true or not. And I just wanna spend the next 20 or so minutes to go over uh, why we actually have this situation in the world where there's a lot of doubt about a lot of things. Um, so first off, I'll point out that in the first half of the 20th century, uh, the world was getting a lot better and uh, everybody appreciated what sciences, scientists and engineers were coming up with. We had modern refrigeration and uh, beautiful cars to drive around. Uh, the world of Leave it to Beaver was a great place to be and even with the help of Albert Einstein and then the scientists behind the Manhattan Project, they helped end up the world war in Japan. And at that point in the 1950s, scientists were revered and nobody ever questioned anything that they Kind of talked about it. If they said it, we believed it, except something changed. And the question is, what changed? Well, uh, cigarettes were the real first beginning of this whole thing. It was starting to be known by scientists that cigarettes were addictive. And uh, soon after that, they started to realize that they caused a lot of problems like lung disease and cancer and vascular disease. So the the people behind the tobacco companies said we have to do something about that and they came up with this strategy of we're going to spin doubt about this and we're going to make sure that people don't that they're not sure about it that they disregard what the scientists are saying and they would deny that they that nicotine was addictive even though they actually knew it to the point where they were enhancing the nicotine content in their cigarettes themselves and so this playbook worked very well and it really led to a long delay as to how long it took for say the, uh, you know, the health protection groups to announce that cigarettes were formally bad. But so in addition to cigarettes, then after that there was even secondhand smoke. I mean, remember it's only 20 plus years ago that you would be in a bar or a restaurant or a casino and you'd come home smelling of cigarettes. Uh, acid rain, they applied it to. The ozone hole, they applied it to. Vaccinations has been applied to. And there's been a lot of people who have doubted what scientists have said ever since. I'm going to kind of use examples from two big ones that I think are very prevalent today. One of them is global warming and how a lot of people have spun doubt about that. And the other has to do with COVID and, for example, just whether masks make a difference or not. So it, the, the sort of um, social science aspect of it and the, the philo not the philosophy, the psychology behind why people tend to want to believe these things is pretty complicated, but I'll just sort of point out quickly where it comes from. And we'll just use the fossil fuels as an example. Obviously, fossil fuels make companies a lot of money. ExxonMobil is the largest corporation on the planet. So they have a vested interest in having people use their products and spinning the doubt about whether burning fossil fuels is bad. And then they have politicians who depend on their support. So a lot of politicians will say what the lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry want, to, want them to say. And a lot of people who follow that ideology of those politicians will start to believe it without ever really questioning anything about it. And then that'll extend to anything else they say about anything else. It's kind of an all or none. You won't find somebody out there who's a Trump supporter who says, well, I agree with him about fossil fuels, but I really don't agree with him about wearing masks. You're going to hear that they're going to just kind of buy in all 100% with respect to this. So I'm just going to touch on a few techniques that people use to spread misinformation about out there about various things. 
The idea being, if you can start to recognize it, then you yourself can become skeptical about it. Some of them I'll use are a little bit light, thanks to uh, Jimmy Kimmel. So hopefully you're not offended by anything you might see on ABC at 11.30 p.m. I promise anything that looks bad is bleeped out. But um, the first one is just jumping to conclusions. And this one is kind of a human nature one. For a long time, people believed the world was flat because you'd look out on a flat plane and it sure, it looked flat. But um, we've learned over the years since then that it's not flat. This is a a poster from the late 19th century where people still believed the world was flat, uh, a lot of them. Yet that would be hard to argue when every other planet in our, in our solar system, as well as the dwarf planet Pluto, are all round. So that would be odd. But in fact, Eratosthenes, more than 2,000 years ago, using some basic scientific principles, was able to prove that the Earth was round because the shadow at the same time of day was a bit different at a higher latitude. And in fact, if he'd had accurate distance between the two cities, Syene, which is now Aswan, and Alexandria, he would have been within 0.16% of the correct uh, diameter of the planet. So he himself was able to prove that a long time ago. And yet we'll still hear there are some rap artists out there who still think it's flat. There was a famous little dialogue back and forth between Neil deGrasse Tyson and B.O.B. a few years ago. So there's some out there still. And we bring it to this one, and this is actually President Trump before he was president. Oh no, sorry, this one is, I've got another one where it's before he's president. This one was just last year. And here he says, like in the beautiful Midwest, wind chill temps are reaching minus 60 degrees, coldest ever recorded. In coming days, expected to get even colder. People can't last outside even for minutes. What the hell is going on with global waning? I mean, it's the R. Please come back fast, we need you. So that's jumping to a conclusion. It's cold outside, therefore global warming must not exist. If I could give him one minute, well, he'd probably take a little more than one minute, but I can give you one minute and I'll explain why that happens. The temperature difference between the tropics and the Arctic is what helps drive the jet stream. But the Arctic warms faster than, the t than other places on the planet. And as a result, the temperature gradient is less. Well, that's the energy, the engine that drives the jet stream. So it becomes slower and wavier. And so you're gonna get these large polar vortices that come down from the north uh, part of the planet. And that's why you can have this huge pocket of cold air affecting us for weeks at a time. And so that's why there can be cold temps in the eastern seaboard, but it doesn't mean that global warming is not real. Another one that people do is cherry picking data. This is a very popular technique people will use. And I'm gonna give you some examples that I have found on some websites that argue that global warming isn't real. Here's one, Greenland has gained 510 billion tons of ice over the last year. This was posted two years ago. Absolutely factually correct, no doubt about it. Problem is, that's not the way you gotta look at it. You've gotta look at it over the long term. And as you can see from this span of over about 20 years, although it does rise and fall and rise and fall, on average, it's dropping by about 286 billion tons a year. So you can't just look at one little nugget of time and say, ah, it climbed and therefore the global warming isn't real and the ice isn't melting. The same has been applied to the Antarctic. Here's another study that was published a few years ago. Mass gains of the Antarctic ice sheet exceed losses. And this website used that as a strategy to argue that global warming wasn't real. And it's the very same technique that happens. You, they use a very small pocket of time. The scientists aren't trying to mislead people, but the people who use that information do by trying to sort of sway people away from the fact that over the long term is what really matters. So that's an important one is cherry picking data that suits their, their information. Another one is raising impossible expectations. And here's a good one. This has to do with the vaccines that we're waiting for for COVID. And I wanna give you a little bit of background about um, any kind of a drug trial takes a long time to get through to uh, the market. And first of all, there's these phase one trials and many of them fail. Often it's being tested on animals and then on healthy human beings and then on human beings with the disease. And those are the phase three trials. And then finally it has to be approved, proven to be safety. Uh, for all of the people who take it and takes a long time to do this. In fact, here are the vaccine timelines. So varicella to help prevent shingles or deal with shingles has taken a lot uh, over 20 years. Even the pediatric combination for the childhood diseases we try to prevent like measles and mumps and rubella and so on, that took 11 years to do. So when somebody like President Trump comes along and says, we don't really need to do anything about it because we've got viruses that are gonna, or vaccines that are gonna be available before the election, that was just a bit unrealistic because even at the very best, we'd be hoping 18 months and that's with a very accelerated timeline. This is what it would normally take 
If it was like any other vaccine out there, it probably would have taken until 2033. They're working very hard on it. Realistically, by the time people will get it en masse, it's probably well into next year. And certainly that was not an appropriate strategy to just say we could just wait for the vaccine. So that's an unrealistic expectation. Here's another popular approach. Let's rely on experts. And I put experts in quotation marks because not everybody who has some authority is necessarily an expert on a subject. So I'm gonna give you one example here. Um, I'm gonna to have to, I don't, can't read that all completely because I've got some on the, on the pictures on the side of the people who are here, but essentially this doctor who I do know uh, has, who's got a PhD has denied that carbon dioxide is a pollutant and that reducing greenhouse gases won't achieve significant reductions uh, and that the cost of the policies would far exceed, exceed the benefits. Now, the thing about it is he's an expert, but he's not a scientist in climate. He's a scientist in economics. He's a, a social scientist. So right off the bat, some experts are experts in something other than what they're speaking about. And so the point, and also, even if he was a climate scientist, you can find certain mavericks out there. And that's what a lot of these groups will do is hold on to these folks. So I'm going to use two examples from this specific expert. He argued the hockey stick graph from over 20 years ago wasn't accurate. If you don't know what that is, I'll show it to you in a second. And he also argued that a carbon tax shouldn't be applied until the planet is warming. Well, and in fact, as an economist, you might even argue maybe he has a point there. But let's talk about these first. Is the planet warming? He argued that this, which is known as the hockey stick graph, a graph was inaccurate, that the last thousand years, the temps were stable, and then they started to climb after we started to burn fossil fuels. And he argued that was not accurate information, assuming so many other people did too. But is that true? Well, if we look past 2000, we can see that those temps are continuing to climb, even since that he argued that was not true. And that's using five different databases from around the planet that all coincide with each other very closely. In fact, of the hottest 20 years ever recorded, and we've been pretty accurate since the late 1800s, 19 of them have been since the year 2001, when it was already being argued that that information was not accurate. In fact, the five hottest years are the five last years we had. So it is still an ongoing problem. So he's wrong about that. The hockey stick graph was accurate. But now is a carbon tax reasonable? As an economist, you might think that might make sense. But let's look to the economists who won the Nobel Prize two years ago. And what they got the Nobel Prize for was arguing that the most efficient remedy for problems caused by greenhouse gas emissions is a global scheme of carbon tax. And that's been well proven in other things where somebody has taxed something, it disincentivizes people to use those products. The key here is it really should be global. Everyone should have it. It won't work well if some countries do and some don't. But even the, the ones who have won the Nobel Prize in economics have made that argument. Here's another one, questioning the motivation of scientists. There's a quote, I like Michael Crichton's stories, but I don't necessarily like his philosophies. Here he said, whenever you hear a consensus of scientists agreeing on something or other, reach for your wallet because you're being had. I would think that's a little inaccurate. And I'm gonna show you a little fun clip from Jimmy Kimmel that helps illustrate that. So let's see if this little video will work here for us. I gotta zip ahead. I wanna talk about Sarah Pill. Okay. I'm a paleoclimatologist and isotope geochemist. Hi, I'm Alex Hall and I'm a climate scientist. I'm Jeremy Pell and I'm a hydroclimatologist. I'm Nina Karnofsky and I'm a polar ecologist. I'm Chuck Taylor and I'm an environmental analytical chemist. I'm John Dorsey. I'm a marine environmental scientist. Over the past 40 years, thousands of scientists have studied climate change. Definitely happening. And it's caused by human beings. That's you and me. And the consequences could be extremely dire catastrophic apocalyptic and here's the thing when we tell you all this we're not with you <laughs> not with you definitely not with you why would we with you think about it if i wanted to screw with people do you think i would have gone into climate science <laughs> with you. i'm sure we could do a lot better than anthropogenic climate change i'd probably tell you that a meteor was coming and then try to sell you a helmet we know about this stuff. We have PhDs. In science. This is not a prank. This is not a prank. Once when I was younger, I locked one of my buddies in the porta potty, then pushed it over. Now that's a prank. Global warming, real. It's real. Man-made. Caused by carbon pollution. Temperatures soaring. Oceans rising. Ice melting. For real. We're not with you. We're not not for our generation, then for his. 
So I hope that wasn't offensive. It's Jimmy Kimmel on ABC, but it's, uh, I think they try and get their point across pretty well. There's not very little reason why a whole bunch of scientists all over the planet would try and, and uh, screw with people about this sort of thing. And when a conspiracy theory is touted by the fossil fuel industry, they have a lot more to gain by this than the scientists that they're arguing against. And that brings me to the next one, promoting conspiracy theories. So this was the old one I was thinking from Donald Trump that happened four years before he was elected. The concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. That's a pretty strong conspiracy. Uh, Senator James Inhofe has also said the same sort of thing. He's written an entire book about it. Um, so I'm going to use a few examples of some conspiracy theories that have been used recently for COVID-19, that COVID-19 was engineered in a lab in China. Here's why it's false. The DNA, DNA sequence does not match any of the sequences in any of the viruses in that lab. And in fact, intelligence agencies have already looked into this in great detail, and they have denied the possibility. But this is why people believe it. They want a scapegoat to blame for what's going on in another country, especially a, competitive, a competitor, is an easy target. And accidental lab releases have occurred. So there's enough plausibility behind it. And of course, President Trump said it and his supporters are gonna more or less buy anything he says. Spreading misinformation is another very common one. I'm gonna use some examples then on that too. If you ever check Donald Trump's Twitter feed, pretty much now almost all of them has some little blue claim up there that uh, Twitter does saying that the information here may not be accurate or factual. And, uh, but spreading misinformation happens a lot on the internet. And he's not the only one who does it. When Maxime Bernier was considering trying to run for the leadership in Canada for the Conservative Party, he himself just a year ago said, there's no scientific consensus on a theory that CO2 produced by human activities causing dangerous global warming today or will in the future. And that's just flat out wrong. There's a lot of consensus. In fact, here was a study published, now it's eight years ago, but looking at almost 14,000 climate articles and only 24 of them actually rejected the concept that global warming was real and man-made. So that works out to 0.17% of all of them. That's pretty strong consensus. I think it's impossible to get 100% of everybody, but that is not enough doubt about it. And if you had that kind of consensus saying you need to have this surgery or that cancer treatment, I think you should go for it. This was an interesting study published based on Twitter's, Twitter tweets, and it showed that when you get to more extreme sides of the political spectrum, you do tend to pass along misinformation or spread that information. Um, but you'll notice that the conservative side tended to, to do it more than the liberal side, and that what tended to do it the least and actually kind of question the information they saw was just left of center. I'm not making any political comments about that. It's just an interesting fact. But the more extreme somebody is in their political viewpoint, the more likely they are to buy into that and spread the misinformation themselves. So here's a few examples we'll use of that. An increase in cases is just because of increased testing. Here's why it's false. If that was true, the percentage of positive cases should decline. But in fact, it's increasing. Hospitalizations and deaths would also be decreasing if that was the case, because we'd just be getting a lot more negative results. But that's not what's happening. But people believe it because we do have more testing available now. And so they start to think that's possible. And of course, Trump said it. Hydroxychloroquine is an effective treatment, another one that was touted out there. Why that's false? There was only one initial study from France that suggested it was beneficial. Many since have proven otherwise. But why do people believe it? Well, they like to believe the first thing they hear about something. So that's actually referred to as an anchoring bias where you just hold on to that information. And of course, again, President Trump said it, so that buys into his support. So I'm just gonna finish with this one last Jimmy Kimmel clip. Uh, to, as to what we can try to do to help uh, deal with people who spread misinformation. Again, hopefully it'll end on a bit of a positive, fun little note. So let me just get to the right spot here. According to new report. Okay. Please listen. Hi, I'm actor, director, and two times sexiest man alive. Science has given us unprecedented knowledge of the natural world from subatomic particles to the majesty of space. Science enables us to cure diseases, to communicate across great distances, and to fly. Tragically, though, the volumes of invaluable knowledge gathered over centuries are now threatened by an epidemic of dumb idiots saying dumb You know what this is? It's a snowball, so it's very, very cold out. Dumb is highly contagious, infecting the minds of even the most stable geniuses. If you have a windmill anywhere near your house, they say the noise causes cancer. You tell me that one, okay? Wow. As a result, rampant dumb now threatens our health, our security, and our planet.
Fortunately, there is hope. At United to defeat untruthful misinformation and support science. You dumbass. Your generous you dumbass will provide desperately needed knowledge to dumb idiots on Facebook and Twitter all around the world. Just $20 will convince one idiot that climate change is real. He will teach five brainless dumb to vaccinate their kids. Knuckle draggers that dinosaurs existed, but not at the same time as people. In the fight against dumb idiots. Call this number today. Operators are standing by. Don't be a idiot. The world needs your support. You dumbass. So um, that was my presentation. I'm sorry if uh, any of it touches any nerves. It is important to appreciate that there's a lot of strategies a lot of people use to make science seem uh, inaccurate or questionable. And I would love us to be able to go back to the simpler times in the first half of the 20th century where scientists were just accepted as being the smart ones on the planet and what they had said made a lot of difference. Uh, Trump was at a meeting in California about the wildfires and he said, I don't think science knows. And it's like, well, who else is going to know better than them? So anyways, I hope that uh, helps arm you with some tools so you can maybe do your own discerning when you hear information out there in the Twitter sphere or on Facebook or wherever you might cross paths with someone. Thank you, Brad. Now, are there questions? You know, it's kind of hard to see when it comes to the screen. Any questions here live? Okay. Brad, did you actually call the phone number in the last video? <laughs> I wish I could. Believe me, I think that'd be one of the charities Catherine and I would be donating to if it was possible. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just kind of figured knowing you, it, it might be something that you would actually test out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not seeing any on chat. Can I keep track here? Okay. Marshall. Thank you, uh, President Devin. Thank you, uh, Brad. I had two thoughts when I was um, listening to your presentation. The first one is one that uh, uh, I've um, had reinforced over the last little while, and I'm wondering, uh, about the, the the fact that we really need more emphasis on uh, what I would call the common good versus uh, individual liberties. I, I watched the, uh, the barbecue company that wants to uh, allow everybody to come and eat and don't bother to mask. I know that masks aren't comfortable, but they save the lives of others who we might come into contact with. But there seems to be this fight between my personal liberty and what's good for the, for the, for the rest of the globe. I also feel, and this really directly came into contact when I saw your, uh, your, when I heard your presentation, that is, we need a lot better information uh, to fight not only misinformation, but disinformation. I've got to say that uh, I'm proud to be a Rotarian, uh, where, as you can see from Dr. Tish's uh, presentation, we really value the lives and, uh, and the values of our global cousins, even sometimes more than our own. I'm also grateful that we have people of science like Brad Dibble, willing to take the time to explain to the non-scientists like myself uh, the real information behind some of the most serious problems that face uh, me and that will face uh, both my kids and my grandkids uh, in years to come. Thank you very much for bringing us this message, uh, Brad, uh, on behalf of our Rotary Club. Uh, thanks very much, Marshall. And just one point you raised um, made me have one thought about that when you're talking about personal liberties and freedoms versus the common good. Uh, an example I'd like to think about is during World War II and the Battle of Britain and the Blitz that was happening and every night London was being bombarded and everybody had to black out their lights. And that'd be like some people saying, you know what, we're going to leave our lights on. We don't care. It's our personal freedom to keep our lights on. And yet the entire city did exactly what they needed to do to try to save lives. And I think it's the same sort of thing here. Personal liberties are important, but not when they put others at risk. So thank you. Well, I'm sure that David Tish would probably like to drive, drive about 140, 150 kilometers in his brand new car, but he does realize <laughs> that the speed limits and they're done so that other people won't die in car crashes. Awesome. Thank you. And, and thank you, Brad, again. Always enjoy having you come and talk with us. And uh, it's always informative and uh, easy enough for even me to understand. So I really appreciate that. So a certificate for coming up here. 
uh, certificate of appreciation and a thank you for being our guest speaker. As you know, Rotary is this close to ending polio worldwide. So we have made a donation of polio vaccinations in your name, as well as a donation towards Rotary, Rotary's Polio Resource Center's uh, fight against COVID-19. Um, they're in, they're oh, getting tongue tied. Uh, they're helping by supporting the preparedness and response activities in many countries. So a contribution again has been made in your name. So thank you very much for coming out and speaking with us. And let's see, and next week's speaker is our very own Chris Vanniekirk for a, um, for his own story. So that's gonna be interesting too, so catch that one. Now we have President Deb's Stronger Together, Together Inspired Moment. So we have Rotary, UNICEF and WHO to make Africa polio free. And here's what it takes to conduct a single National Immunization Day in India. So I won't read through each of those, but I will give you a second to read it. And it does certainly speak to the numbers and the volume of people that it takes to make something happen. And the bottom line was 172 million children were immunized, and that's pretty impressive. Can we have the other picture? And there's the camels at work. So certainly powerful and impactful and definitely meaningful. Having no other business, for the good of Rotary, I declare this meeting adjourned. Thanks again, Brad. Really.